Mr. Mbulubunaka, and welcome everyone to the Amelinija uh, Vaccine Question and Answers uh, that we are hosting tonight. Um, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we are tuning in from traditional Bidjigal country here in Southwest Sydney uh, of the Eora Nation here in Sydney and so-called Australia. And uh, we'd like to acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. And uh, we'd also like to acknowledge uh, you know, the illegal occupation of West Papua and the Maluka Islands. And, um, you know, we, we pay our respects to Indigenous people all over the world and um, even in Melanesia. Um, so I'd like to welcome everyone. Um, if you're tuning in again uh, from the last session, I'd like to welcome you again. And if you're tuning in for the first time, I'd like to say a big bulavanaka to you. And thank you for, for joining us um, on this lovely evening. Um, so, as we begin, you know, COVID is a you know very, very, very hot topic at the moment. It's, it's affecting everyone, and I'm sure um, a lot of you have some burning questions that you'd like to ask. So, um, we'd like to just remind everyone to, you know, please be respectful of everyone's opinions and um, beliefs, um, and try to you know approach this with an open mind. Um, um, we have to, you know, um, and also we'd like to introduce you to two of our finest doctors in um, that are joining us here today, our experts. We've got Dr. Bangana and uh, Dr. Uto. Um, they've got a very, very long resume, so I don't think we'd have enough time to, to mention them. But uh, before they begin, everyone just pop your locations in the comment section. We'd like to know where you're coming from and where you're representing. And um, yeah, to start us off, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Vangana to start us off with the stats. Okay, uh, good night everyone. It's uh, nice to be with you again for this session. Um, uh, Q and A session, and I'm glad to join the team again in this uh, uh, very important uh, uh, informative uh, session on COVID-19, especially on vaccination. Uh, so I'll start off by showing you a global view of the countries that have been vaccinated so far. Um, and uh, um, as a point, uh, if the DACA you are on this uh, on this map here. Uh, what it means is there's more people who are vaccinated. If the color is more lighter, it means that uh, less people are vaccinated. So you can, you can see that uh, um, most of the countries that are that well vaccinated at the moment, I'll come to the percentages later. Um, actually, the Asian countries, uh, uh, Europe, North America, and you can see that uh, Africa is do doing very badly at the moment, and also the Pacific Islands. Uh, you look at PNG, it's, it's so light, and uh, Solomon and Wanot, you can barely see, see them on the map, uh, which means that we are not doing too, too well with our vaccination uh, rates. By way of uh, global um, uh, numbers, uh, Currently, there's more than 40% 40, 40 of the world's population ha have been vaccinated. And of those, roughly more than 30% have had the full two doses of the, of the vaccine. So that's roughly about 30%. Um, and I just had the United Nations uh, presentation by uh, uh, the US President Joe Biden, um, that was yesterday. And what he said was uh, in his uh, UN address was he he aim his main aim is to have the world population um, vaccinated by up to seventy percent by September of next year. Now, according to some of the experts, that's actually a big ask, um, assuming or you know, looking at the current rates where it's it's so slow, especially. 
in the Pacific and, and the African countries and several reasons given where uh, not only because of hesitancy, but of course the availability of the, of the vaccines. And so what the president said was um, um, uh, the US is gonna purchase about $5 million of, of, the, of the vaccines to give to the less developed countries who need it. Next slide, please. Okay, so over here, uh, uh, this is a chart showing some of the countries in the world who are actually doing very well. Um, and if you look at the top there, you have uh, United Arab Emirates, Portugal, and uh, Iceland with Malta. These are the, the four countries in the world currently who, who have uh, more than 80% of their population that have been fully vaccinated. The dark colored uh, uh, bar charts are, are the fully vaccinated one and the, the light green ones are, you know, those ones who are passively vaccinated, just one dose of the vaccine. Um, and then you have, so if you add all of them who have reached the herd immunity, so starting from Denmark, 75%, Singapore, 77 Spain, 77 also, uh, and Qatar, 76 those are the ones who are, um, uh, have also reached their herd immunity apart from the top four that I mentioned earlier on. And in the Pacific, you have at the bottom there Fiji, which has the highest rate uh, amongst the Pacific Island countries, including Australia and New Zealand. So Fiji is currently doing very well. 43% of the population is now fully uh, vaccinated. Next slide. Okay, so, so this one shows uh, the, uh, you know, the Pacific Island countries, including Australia and New Zealand, plus uh, uh, Papua New Guinea, Solomons, uh, one not enough, course, Fiji. So Fiji tops the list, as I've said earlier on, 43%, and it is followed by uh, New Zealand uh, with 34% who are fully vaccinated, and then Australia is on 30%. Uh, New Caledonia too is not doing too bad on 28%. Vanuatu, um, where I'm living currently, is 4.6% who are fully vaccinated, followed by Solomons, 3.3%. And uh, Papua New Guinea, the the recent uh, statistics released about 1.5% of the population have been fully vaccinated. So they, they are really struggling at the moment due to uh, vaccination hesitancy there. And of course, um, the slow rollout to the, to the provinces and of course, to the rural areas. Next slide. Thank you, Dr. Wangana. Um, so with the background information, you know, it's good to see the Pacific Islands, um, you know, making their way towards, uh, you know, herd immunity all throughout the, the Pacific. And uh, with even countries like uh, Palau reaching herd immunity too, I heard, I heard on the news. Um, I think they're, they've reached about 85% recently. So, you know, things are, Things are turning around for, for the Pacific, which is great news. Um, with that being said, and everything going on right now, we'd like to begin our Q&A session. Uh, just remember, if you have a question you'd like to ask uh, some of our experts, just uh, raise your hands and we invite you to, you know, uh, show, your, show your lovely and beautiful faces. Uh, and, you know, uh, yeah. With, uh, with that being said, we'll go to our first question, which is, yeah, next slide. So many doctors in uh, Papua New Guinea, especially uh, are talking about, you know, focusing on sick, on sick people, the elderly, and the immunocompromised uh, instead of vaccines because they don't think young people should suffer the consequences of a new vaccine. 
what was the experience in uh, Fiji in terms of the health system handling the amount of patients in the recent Delta variant outbreak? In your opinion, is prevention better than cure or vaccination or is treatment of sick people more practical for our health systems? Uh, perhaps I will speak to this because this question is uh, seeking if uh, we can share the experience in Fiji. Um, so if I can just speak about uh, our unit here at the uh, Colonial War Memorial Hospital uh, here in Suva, <clears throat> what we had experienced since uh, April was, there was a rapid rise in the um, community transmission of the disease. Uh, so because of that, uh, there, there were uh, the rising number of cases, uh, one in the adult hospital, in the uh, uh, women, uh, women's hospital, the maternity unit, uh, and then we begin to see uh, this, uh, the community transmission within children as well. Uh, so what has happened was since uh, that transmission, both uh, the public health as well as the hospital, uh, we embark on measures uh, in, in which we try to limit um, the, the transmission. So essentially what that means is um, we actually, the entire uh, normal operation of the hospital ceased, you know, it, it totally ceased uh, because now we have to deal with the um, patients presenting uh, with the disease. Uh, so uh, for a start, uh, the kids uh, hospital did not experience so much of the number of cases uh, presenting to the adult hospital and uh, uh, dying there. And you have a situation where uh, there was a risk of transmission between uh, patients within the adult hospital, uh, as well as to staff or to from staff to patient. Uh, that was the potential risk that it, uh, existed. Uh, and uh, we had to set up isolation of uh, patients within sections of the hospital, and as well as uh, to uh, seclude the staff from uh, returning back to their homes and therefore at risk of uh, contracting the uh, COVID with, uh, which is tr uh, being transmitted within the community. So uh, what this led to is um, the Ministry of Health had to uh, spend uh, uh, funds in order to protect its staff from the infection and thereby um, have to shuttle them from hotels uh, which uh, to the hospital to do the work and uh, quarantine them from going back to their homes in the community where the transmission is. So this, this actually is an expensive exercise to, to try and protect your staff, your resources uh, in order to deal with the um, number of uh, COVID positive patients uh, who are in hospital. So uh, especially uh, of note is those who had underlying diseases uh, of background diseases and then again contracted the uh, COVID uh, uh, disease. Uh, 
the COVID-19. Uh, so we experienced uh, deaths from April up to uh, September, uh, the month we are in. And our number is about, uh, they were about, uh, uh, we haven't reached 500, but at the last count some uh, two weeks ago, we, we were almost getting there, over 450 uh, cases. So that's within a spate of uh, four months, we, we experienced that. Uh, so we closed down the normal services and uh, readied the hospital to cater for the, the oncoming uh, COVID disease uh, and as well as to protect the staff and to protect cross infection. And this become, became an expensive exercise. Uh, so uh, that was the situation we experienced in in Fiji. So what this means is, uh, for instance, the children's clinics has not opened yet in the hospital I'm working in. So the children's clinics have not opened. And as you know, the clinics are a way of managing kids in order to, to prevent the rise of emergencies. And now that's, that's lost. So essentially, uh, that's an expensive exercise, dealing with emergencies all the time. Okay, probably that's a long answer. Dr. Vangana, you might have something to say, say about that, but that's the experience in Fiji. We shut down services because of the uh, rising number of COVID uh, cases within the community presenting to the hospital. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Auto. And yes, um, Dr. Vangana, I understand you're working working in, uh, in Vanuatu at the moment. So would you be able to provide yeah. us a perspective on um, you know, the current situation as well in Vanuatu regarding this question? Okay, uh, so if I can just rephrase the question. Uh, I think the first part is asking about uh, more focusing on the, on the disease than the vaccination, is it? Sorry, can you put the question back up again? I'm, yeah, I can, I can read it up. Uh, if we get that slide up, yeah. So many doctors in, in uh, Papua New Guinea, especially are talking about focusing on the sick people, you know, the elderly and the immunocompromised uh, instead of the vaccine, because I don't think young people should suffer the consequences of the, the new vaccine. Um, what was, I guess we're, we're going to get your um, perspective on the experience in Vanuatu in terms of the health and the handling of the, um, the outbreak. Okay, thank you. So if I can just answer that, uh, the first part of the question first. Uh, so I think that's, that's really the wrong attitude of just focusing on treating the old people. All right, I think, I think we should focus more on not only treating the, the sick people, but of course, preventing uh, future diseases, preventing people from actually getting diseased or getting sick. And that, that's the hallmark of vaccination. And it's, it's not that we are just targeting um, uh, the young people only, trying to vaccinate the young people only. Um, as, as, as you can see, what the world is doing now is uh, vaccinating the, the older age group first, those ones who are at high risk of dying from COVID. So of course, the older age group with underlying medical issues. And then it, it's now making its way down to the young and healthy people because, you know, of course, with the Delta variant now, it's uh, uh, the infectious uh, rate in, in young people, especially children, has now uh, increased markedly compared to, to before. So uh, it's vaccinating everyone, not only the old people, but, but the young, young people as well. Uh, so we are, we are trying to prevent the disease itself and, of course, treating those who are, who are actually sick from the COVID. Um, my experience here in Vanuatu, at the moment, we are, we are still, still on, on, um, on uh, scenario one, one if, you, if you are following the WHO 
uh, scenarios, uh, three different scenarios. You have one where you don't have any active cases, all right, at the moment. So, so for us, we don't have any at the moment. Uh, and two A is when you when you have a border border case, and uh, two B is uh, you have uh, an outbreak within the country, and then uh, three scenario three will be um, local outbreaks. You know, there are pockets of areas where the disease is actually rife. So um, we are on lockdown actually at the moment. Um, so, and, and this, um, the, the measures that we, we took here in Vanuatu are actually <clears throat> quite strict at the moment. Um, so, um, we, I haven't managed any active cases yet here in Vanuatu. But the preparation is going and we have some big uh, plans going if we have any of these uh, cases coming into Vanuatu. Uh, we have a flight uh, from, uh, a repatriation flight coming from Fiji over this weekend. And we are preparing for that because uh, uh, there might be some, some cases coming with the, in the flight as well, new ones who, who are trying to come back to, to Vanuatu. Um, and the danger is, um, you know, if, if there's a breach of uh, border security over here and it spills over into the general population, then um, definitely our health uh, uh, infrastructure of systemia will be overwhelmed. Uh, as you know, Vanuatu is actually quite small compared to uh, Fiji, uh, uh, maybe a little bit smaller compared to Solomon and also smaller compared to Papua New Guinea. Um, but we are, we've, we've set all our uh, standard operating procedures. So, so for pediatrics, we, we have our own and all, of course the other different uh, departments within the, the hospital setting they, they have their so, so we are we are in, in, uh, preparing for for any any cases that that might come in and of course if we have uh, local outbreaks an overwhelming number of cases then uh, uh, we are also prepared for for that as well so that's the situation here in in one or two yeah so uh, just uh, also don't be complacent and don't think that the young people are protected. Um, we see uh, a few people aged like in their twenties who died from the disease. And now we are seeing the children uh, being admitted to hospital with severe complications. Uh, the multi-inflammatory, um, multi-system, eh? multi-inflammatory uh, systemic uh, disease. So uh, unless we break the transmission by um, immunizing a large segment of the older population where, where the vaccines have been trialed, then you cannot break the transmission to these children who will suffer these uh, consequences of uh, severe consequences of the COVID as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wangana and Dr. Auto. Um, I believe you smashed the answer out of the park there. So with all that being said, we'll go on to the next question. We can get that onto the screen. Get that going in a minute, but I believe the next question was: How efficient uh, are the the current vaccines against the Delta variant, and are they being improved? Maybe I'll get uh, Dr. Wangana to start on this one. Okay, uh, according to the current data for the for the um, the AstraZeneca, it's sixty seven percent effective against the, the Delta variant. And I think Pfizer is a little bit higher than that, probably 70 or 75. Um, so, so those are the two that, that, that I know which are, but similar uh, Pfizer and Modern are actually, actually similar. Um, so I think that's, that's answering the question where it's, it's it's uh, they are effective according to the current data. They are effective against the the Delta variant as well. 
Yeah, there is uh, there is good uh, um, immune uh, production once you get uh, AstraZeneca is the common one amongst us, the islands. And uh, recently, um, I think just this week, uh, the Oxford team uh, released some data which indicated that it's actually higher than 67% uh, doc. Uh, in fact, approaching, approaching 90. Uh, plus, uh, there is data coming out that the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine in terms of the uh, waning immunity, AstraZeneca is better than uh, the two uh, lipid uh, uh, mRNA uh, vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna. I think Australia is finding that out at the moment. Uh, and people would like to switch to take the Astra. That's, uh, that's what I heard from colleagues in uh, uh, Sydney. Yeah, I think just, just to add on that, that, that's very true. There was a, an article I read on, um, um, I think it was in Thailand, where uh, uh, they were using, uh, initially using um, Sinopharm, and then uh, they, for the similar reason that, that uh, Dr. Arthur have uh, uh, given that um, the, because of the effect of AstraZeneca in the long term, uh, they advise the population to, to get a booster, booster of AstraZeneca. Um, so that was in an article I read a few, few weeks ago regarding AstraZeneca being effective, especially against the, the Delta variant because Delta variant has just become an issue in, in um, Thailand at the moment. Great. So like with that being said, would it be accurate to say that, you know, even though it's not 100% effective, it's like, um, it's more just an added measure to keep everyone safe. Like it's one thing just to have the mask, but it's, an, it's just an extra layer to get that vaccine as well to keep you um, extra safe from, from the virus. Would that be um, somewhat of an accurate way to say it from a layman's point of view? Yeah, well, uh, yes. Sorry, Doc, you go ahead. Yeah, it's one, it's, it's good to maintain uh, the, um, uh, those practices which uh, which you take in order to prevent either transmission to yourself or yourself transmitting to others. So that's good practice, health, hygiene, uh, distancing, mask, uh, not to cough into someone's face. You know, all those sort of things are <laughs> good practice to do. Um, and it's also good to get the vaccine. Uh, the efficacy of the vaccine, as I prior explained, is uh, that it mediates uh, one from getting severe forms of COVID-19 and then you succumb and die. Uh, it may not be like uh, missiles, which is like preventive. Once I have the missile shot, the uh, uh, the missiles won't ever uh, enter. It's neutralized at entry. Uh, but I can get the uh, coronavirus once I've had the vaccine, but I would not develop the severe form of the disease. And therefore I have stand better chance of surviving the COVID since I have a lesser, uh, uh, lesser form uh, of the illness. Yeah, but what I was gonna say was, there's no, <coughs> excuse me, there's no vaccine that that has hundred percent protection, um, and I would like to know which vaccine has that, and definitely I'll go for that vaccine. But uh, usually, well. With the modern and the Pfizer, it's about 95, 97% uh, protection. 
uh, against uh, uh, COVID-19. Uh, but even the previous vaccine, none of them have 100% protection. So of course you will still get sick, but, but the, the, the risk of you getting sick is much, much less. Uh, that's one point. And the risk of you uh, getting uh, very sick and admitted to ICU and actually dying is much, much less if you are, if you are vaccinated. Thank you, Dr. Oto and Dr. Wangana. Uh, for everyone worrying at home, um, that cough from Dr. Wangana was not a COVID cough. I think he's had a dry throat, so you can all relax. You know, we're, we're all good here. We're all taking the right measures to keep ourselves safe in the community. Um, so we'll go on to our next question. Thank you for the answers, everyone. Um, and this question, if we can get it on the screen, is from, uh, from the community, from Negol. Uh, here we go. So the question is, um, of all the vaccines produced and now in use, uh, which ones have fully satisfied peer review criteria by medical scientists? Uh, for this question, I might get uh, Dr. Auto to, to begin. Yeah, okay. Thank you uh, for this question. Um, so uh, uh, briefly, what do we mean by a peer review. Uh, peer review is peer is like your colleague or someone at your same same level. Uh, so what this means is uh, those people in the same prof profession are your peers. Okay, that, that's that's what we mean. And peer review means, um, for instance, if if uh, Oxford geneticist uh, publishes a document, you can't be getting a, a form six high school kid to, to review the Oxford scholars work. No, that won't do, that's not a, that's not a peer review. So uh, we can't get like uh, these scientists work or in medical scientists, or the research uh, uh, doctors work uh, then be reviewed by uh, just uh, people from the street you know, that, that cannot qualify as peer review. Uh, because of course they'll say anything about the, the research paper uh, without actual, actually uh, seeing uh, the details of it and making the judgment or uh, without actually replicating the studies themselves. Peers can replicate your, your study. Uh, so one thing I want to point out is that there is so many so-called uh, peer reviewed websites which review this uh, scientist's work, work. But I have yet, for instance, uh, the uh, uh, Dr. Gilbert and Group, a medical scientist in Oxford, who produced the AstraZeneca vaccine and who stated in their paper that this is what the components of the vaccine are. Just, just like Dr. Vangana mentioned the other time, what are the components of the vaccine? So uh, these scientists have mentioned the components of the vaccine. It has undergone trial. And who are the peers who reviewed it? So the peers who reviewed it are also other molecular uh, uh, biologists and also the, the uh, regulatory agencies. The regulatory agencies are not just any Tom, Dick, and Harry. <laughs> you know, they, they also consist of scientists who work in those regulatory bodies and therefore look at the papers and can, if, if uh, uh, required, see, see about replicating the studies uh, and, and all doing analysis uh, of the vaccines. So um, one thing I want to point out is so many scientists who speak against this AstraZeneca vaccine or the Pfizer, none of them, none, 
none of them has produced a paper to say that I analyzed AstraZeneca and I found 666 mark of the beast in it. <laughs> no, not one of them has done, ever done that. Or he analyzed the vaccine and says that I found something which is some genomic sequence which is beyond what's currently in the AstraZeneca. None. All they do is like speculate about the vaccine. Oh, it's a gene, it's a DNA, it's a, say that. But okay, so if you are so worried about it, go to your lab and sequence the vaccine and tell me what you found is entirely different from what the, the uh, scientist in Oxford uh, has, has created. Is it entirely different? I guarantee you, not one of those people who claims he is, he is uh, seeing something different in the AstraZeneca, not a single one has sequenced the AstraZeneca vaccine. Not one of them. None of them. All they do is talk. So you leave it up to Gilbert and her group. They, they got the correct sequences. The correct sequences is seen by the regulatory bodies, the European Medical uh, Standards or EMA or EMU, I can't quite remember, if the FDA in the uh, States, they do that and they realize that, okay, what they claim is actually what we found. So that is a peer review, that they are being reviewed by colleagues of similar and like standing. So that's what has happened. Those sequences they talk about, the RNA or the DNA, it's actually what they claim it is. Uh, so that's what has happened if we're talking about the molecular biology of it. So Dr. Vangan, I'll leave you to talk about the phase, different phases of the human trials. Okay, so, so just, to, uh, just to go along with uh, James' uh, answer, so, uh, if you go back to our first presentation from before, there are different phases that have to be followed before a vaccine is, is approved for usage in a, in a human population. So it's not on the PowerPoint, but I'll just briefly go through them again. So initially you have the exploratory phase where you have a disease and then a group says, oh, maybe we should, deal, uh, you know, um, come up with a vaccine against it, this disease. So the process starts, uh, the, it starts with what, what we call a preclinical phase. And in the preclinical phase, they use uh, not human beings, but uh, guinea pigs or animals to trial the, the vaccine, not only vaccine, but they do that with medicines as well. But since we are talking about vaccine, vaccine follow through the same process as well. So they, they have the preclinical phase, and once they find that it's safe, it's, it's uh, efficacy and, and safety uh, is good you know, for human beings. Then they go to the human trial. And in the human trial, which is called the clinical phase, you have three different phases. So in phase one, you have a small group of people, maybe less than 100, um, usually volunteers who are actually um, healthy, you know, healthy young people. So, so they go through that. And once they see that it's, you know, it's quite safe and it's effective, then they, the number increases to phase two, where there might be a couple of hundreds and they divide them into you know, specific groups and compare them, all right? So uh, you have a, a, a placebo group where say no vaccines, and then you have another group where they actually vaccinated and they compare them. All right, so that, that will be a few hundreds and, Phase three will be in thousands. And um, when they reach that phase, uh, different countries all over the world will be going through the same, same trial, all right? And then uh, after that, it comes to, like in the US, you have FDA, where they analyze everything and then the recommendation comes, you know, this is what we find uh, from this, uh, the different phases. It's presented to, the, to, to FDA and they, uh, they analyze it and say, okay, I think it's, you know, it's safe to use in the, in the human population. So they approve it and then it, you know, 
tell, tells the manufacturer, okay, you manufacture this uh, vaccine. And, and uh, then, okay, sorry, I was just reading this message. And then uh, once, you, <laughs> once you vaccinate, uh, once it's approved, then you vaccinate the human, human population. And then that, you know, um, because it's safe, it's effective. The expected result which should should happen with uh, with the when the vaccination process happens within the human uh, population. So all the vaccines, so you can see it's a rigorous process. It's not an overnight overnight process. And um, some people say that it's within a short period of time. But if you look look through this process, it's it's, it's so long. It's it's uh, it takes a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of brain, you know, working, brain cells working. Um, and as Dr. James said, I'd like to support, well, I support what he said that for this peer review, it's not anyone coming and say, oh, I reviewed your paper and it's false. And, you know, who are you? Just from nowhere and you, you, you come out and say, oh, I'm reviewing your paper and it's, it's, uh, it's useless. No, it doesn't happen that way. Uh, mind you, all the, you know, so, so when you talk about these different journals like uh, BMJ or uh, New England Medical Journal or Lancet, before they, before they release or publish uh, any, any researches, it has to be peer reviewed by people who have the same qualification, the same profession. All right. Uh, it's, it's not as if somebody, any Tom Dick and Aris, just reach the paper, oh, uh, I don't agree with this, I don't agree with that. But your quali qualification doesn't match them and you, you, you didn't actually go through the, the phases as well. So, so that, that's what we mean by, by peer review. And sad to say, as Dr. James said, a lot of people have come out you know, you know, on this uh, website and say, oh, we peer review this, we peer review that. And I think, you should, you should uh, fact check this, this website which say that they peer reviewed a particular uh, uh, article. All right, so check the website and check the, the, the authors of, of those websites. And, and as I've said before, you will find out that a lot of them are actually not uh, uh, qualified uh, people. Yes. Thank you, Doc. Yeah, thank you both of you doctors, you know, it's, uh, it's very important to be critical of all the information you read, especially on the internet, because, um, you know, everything is so easily accessible. Um, and it's good to not just be critical of the information you're reading, but critical of the people writing them. Um, and, you know, it's important to, to appreciate that people have done years and years of thorough research in these specific fields. Um, and to acknowledge that they've done the work to become experts in this field. So um, thank you both for all the work that you've done in the community um, and all the other, um, you know, uh, experts, uh, pediatricians and doctors in the field working tirelessly to, you know, turn this pandemic around. And especially all the nurses and the doctors, you know, they're doing all the hard work. Um, we did have a question. Um, so I would like to call uh, Galaxy J7 2016, if they'd like to come off mute or turn on their camera and come off mute. So I saw you raise your hand. All right, I don't think. So maybe it was a typo or an accident. Um, we do have a question uh, from Mary. Uh, Mary, if you'd like to turn on your camera, uh, come off mute. We'd like to see your, your beautiful face here. I'm pretty sure everyone's sick and tired of seeing my face. So if you can show yours, that will be a good break for everyone. Um, and ask your question. Ask away. Thank you. Um, my question was, where does ivermectin come in? Okay, I'll, 
I'll start by answering that question. So I think ivermectin, um, ivermectin is actually uh, a medication that, that's used uh, against, uh, well, scabies. Scabies is, you know, it's, it's one of the first line treatment for scabies at, at the moment. Um, and actually, they, they, there's another uh, different preparation of ivermectin, which is used in animals like horses and so forth um, for parasites, you know, to, to treat against uh, uh, parasites. So, and then um, in the US, now the problem they're having there is uh, there's a lot of confusion about this ivermectin and people are taking both the the, the one that is that is prepared for the, the normal scabies in humans and the one that is usually given to the to the animals uh, and there were a lot of uh, side effects um, that was uh, affecting some of the, the people who were taking it in the states and wh what they said in the in the articles uh, in the state is that currently ivermectin is not approved by FDA and WHO currently. Um, some articles might come out later. Some people say that they, it's effective against COVID-19. But from what I know is uh, if, you, if, you, if you go into the WHO and CDC website, it's not approved by FDA and uh, WHO yet for human use against uh, COVID-19. COVID Okay, I think that's the answer, I think. <laughs> yes. I was going to ask if you had anything to add, but if Dr. Wangana has covered it, then it's covered and I. <laughs> yes. So I don't see any raised hands. So we'll go on to the next question we had in the queue, um, which is by Brother Adrian. Um, so we'll get that on the screen for you. So we've got a couple of questions. We'll go with the first one. Um, while many Pacific countries encourage people to get vaccinated with AstraZeneca, uh, there are many well-educated people, including some medical practitioners, uh, discouraging people to get this particular vaccine. So uh, the reasons are there is no peer-reviewed evidence to support long-term genetic safety of the AZ vaccine um, because it's a vaccine that uses uh, nucleic acid technology to manufacture the vaccines, the technology that works with human genetic code. So what is uh, your response to, to these arguments? Uh, okay, just leave the question uh, with, well, many, what Pacific countries? Educated people, discouraging people. Okay, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's tragic, really. That's, that's what I consider that to be, that uh, a medical practitioner can discourage uh, a lay patient uh, with the vaccine. So um, I'll talk a bit later about uh, this idea of genetic uh, gene editing, which is, is brought up uh, as a means to, to scare, you know, to frighten people from this, this vaccine. And uh, it's, it's brought in by the just, uh, just uh, people associating gen gene editing with this vaccine. There is no uh, direct like cause and effect. It's just, I'm going to talk about gene gene editing and then once they finish talking about it then they say this vaccine has capacity to do that uh, so then now they uh, they associate just from their talk not from any scientific data just from their talk they associate the vaccine with the gene ed ed editing uh, technology and therefore accuse the vaccine. That's the gene editor, the vaccine. That's, that's what's happening here. Uh, so uh, then they scare people away from, from this, this vaccine. Um, 
So uh, I think in the past presentation, we already uh, answered this question. If, if uh, the, um, um, the doctor studies the evidence and tries to remove his, his personal um, uh, prejudice away from the, uh, from the data on the vaccine, uh, then that doctor should be persuaded by the evidence. You know? But if now I come with the whole baggage of prejudice I already have, you know, uh, uh, I think it was Jesus who also said that if they do not believe in Moses, even should someone rise from the dead today, they won't believe. <laughs> Jesus said that once, you know. <laughs> so, so like, uh, if you don't believe it from the horse's mouth, what else are we going to do to make you believe? You know. So, uh, yeah, maybe uh, I say. Uh, I think you got my slides there. I think it's a good time to put this on. Or? Yep, yep. We we'll bring it up now. Yeah. So, uh, if you look closely here. Uh, this diagram, I put it some uh, uh, in the prior presentation. So uh, that is to use the uh, mRNA in Pfizer and Moderna in order to, to generate the spike proteins uh, uh, of the coronavirus against which the immune system then creates uh, the anti uh, neutralizing antibodies and thereby render you uh, immune. Uh, but now, uh, perhaps I did not cover this AstraZeneca very well in, in the past uh, uh, presentation. So, uh, so the scary bit when you look at this uh, AstraZeneca is that there is DNA. <laughs> so there is DNA there. Can you see it as compared to uh, RNA in the other uh, vaccine? So once there is DNA, and then uh, uh, you know that humans have DNA, the two types, different types of nucleic acids here, RNA and DNA. So once you begin to sense that, okay, humans have DNA, and AstraZeneca is using DNA in this vaccine, and then you, you have some limited knowledge about uh, uh, gene editing, at once alarm bells start ringing, you know, <laughs> that's my, that's what I'm showing the alarm bells going off. Oh gosh, this is gene editing uh, technology by Astra, Oxford AstraZeneca. Uh, uh, so uh, as you can see here, the vaccine through the vector, adenoviral vector enters the cell and then finally uh, releases the DNA into the uh, cell nucleus. So this is the scary bit, which people begin to dream up the, uh, uh, the gene editing that, okay, this is what's happening with AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, but as you can see here, this sim simple diagram just shows that the DNA is then transcribed into mRNA, which then undergoes the process that uh, Pfizer and Moderna have because the mRNA enters the cytosol uh, and then uh, uh, the spike proteins are produced. So the DNA uh, that is in this vaccine uh, did not, okay, uh, maybe go to the next slide, uh, uh, Isaac. Uh, next slide. So, uh, yeah, so this DNA is concerning, okay? I admit, once you know a bit about uh, uh, gene ed editing, then uh, it becomes scary once you associate it uh, with that uh, DNA in the AstraZeneca. So just to give you uh, molecular biology within one slide, uh, I'm going to talk a bit about two enzyme systems called reverse transcriptase and integrase. So uh, in the first uh, 
uh, shot up there. Uh, you see uh, this is a virus. And in this particular case, this is the HIV virus. So uh, had we taken some time to read about H HIV virus when the HIV was coming decades ago, probably this question would not have been uh, uh, arising today. But the HIV virus has one capacity. Uh, inside itself is the RNA, HIV RNA. But this, the aim of the virus is it must lodge its own genetic material uh, within the human uh, genome of the cell that it will infect. So remember this HIV virus must enter the cell only uh, through uh, uh, the, uh, or by the CD4 or CD8 cells because they have the receptor, uh, receptors which the virus can, can use to enter. So cells with these receptors, CD4, CD8, can. Uh, particularly, it's the G, uh, GP120 uh, receptor. And there's a core receptor called the CCR5. It's that those receptors which HIV virus uses to attach to the cell and then enter the cell. Now, once it enters the cell, it, it has RNA, which cannot ever link to the human DNA, the human cell DNA, but it wants to do that. So what it does, it, it comes with two enzymes. The virus houses two enzymes. One of those is reverse transcriptase, and one of those is integrase. So the reverse transcriptase in the second uh, um, diagram there converts the, uh, what, what do you call it? The RNA into a double-stranded DNA, okay? So that's what it does. And then uh, it then must enter the host cell, CD4 cell or CD8 cell, and then it must insert this now HIV DNA, not the original HIV RNA. Uh, RNA has now reverse transcribed. Uh, why do they call it reverse transcribed? Because DNAs are transcribed to uh, RNA. That's the natural sequence. From DNA, you get RNA. But HIV has this ability uh, through the enzyme called reverse transcript, uh, transcriptase to go from RNA to DNA. So that's what it does. And before this double-stranded DNA can ever uh, do uh, uh, work to form more uh, HIV uh, particles, it must integrate into the host DNA. So now you have the integrase uh, enzyme system. So this virus comes with its RNA, comes with its reverse transcriptase and comes with, with its integrase, which now integrates the, the DNA formed by the reverse transcriptase into the host DNA. Now, uh, the, the uh, diagram below, uh, now when that host DNA is red and that viral portion of the DNA is red, it then expresses the viral RNA. Uh, as you can see here, which is extruded into the cytoplasm in the next diagram. And then the uh, cell machinery called ribosomes start to manufacture the virus, which then escapes the cell in the last uh, uh, diagram. So ribosomes. Uh, so you have this, this is HIV virus. It comes with the necessary enzyme systems, which will insert uh, the, uh, part, uh, the viral DNA into the, the host DNA, and therefore from there on lead to the production of more um, particles. Next slide.
Okay, so now uh, I'm, uh, this is AstraZeneca uh, uh, adenovirus vector. So the diagram above uh, to your left uh, is the adenovirus. And uh, on uh, to your right is how adenovirus enters uh, into uh, a cell, Let's say the cells of your lining of your nose, okay, to cause a flu. So the entry is by endocytosis. That means once it lands on the receptors, there's folding and the, the virus is taken into the cytoplasm. Uh, so now by microtubular movement, okay, by microtubular movement, adenovirus is already a DNA virus. It's not like HIV, which was an RNA virus. So by microtubular movement, it moves into the host cell uh, nucleus. And there the viral DNA is, is then uh, injected into the nucleus. Now the nuclear machinery then uh, then will uh, will read of the DNA and produce the necessary uh, RNAs, which is extruded to the cytosol, and then the manufacture of the uh, the um, adenovirus particle uh, carries on. So now this adenovirus has no reverse transcriptase. That's its nature. It has no integrase. <laughs> That's its nature. It merely injects its, its DNA material uh, without any integration into the cellular DNA in the nucleus itself. But it is being read by the nuclear, um, uh, after nuclear entry. Okay, so now the, the two diagrams below uh, is the AstraZeneca adenovirus vector. So as you know, uh, uh, AstraZeneca, Oxford, AstraZeneca, they use the adenovirus, which comes from the chimpanzee. Uh, so don't worry, we won't all turn into chimpanzees if we take the vaccine. No, I've taken two. I'm still looking whether I'll still be turning into a <laughs> chimpanzee, but I assure you, we won't. So the reason why they use the chimpanzee Adenovirus is this, because adenovirus humans, we have lived with it down through the decades, centuries. So we develop some immunity to the human adenovirus. And therefore, if I use the human adenovirus, uh, my vaccine will not work because once I introduce it, the human system recognizes it. Oh, human adenovirus grabs it, destroys it with the vaccine in it. So these uh, scientists are uh, thinking one step ahead of them. Okay, let's use the adenovirus from the chimpanzee. And then what is done is they then get the gene for the spike protein of the uh, SARS-CoV-2. That's the coronavirus causing this COVID-19. And cut off the E1 section of the uh, adenoviral uh, genome, that E1 section codes for multiplication of the adenovirus, okay? The E1 section. The, the geneticist cuts it off and instead connects the, uh, uh, the vaccine spike protein gene. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Yes, that one, that bit. Now that is, that gene is now inserted into the adenovirus, uh, which is the, uh, what did we say, chimpanzee uh, adenovirus. So this viral particle cannot multiply because the E1 code for the virus to keep on multiplying once its genes are read has been deleted. So that's what is done. Okay, the DNA, SARS-CoV-2 DNA, remember, coronavirus is a RNA virus, okay? It's not a DNA. So in order for AstraZeneca to arrive at uh, the DNA, 
it reverse transcribe the RNA in the laboratory, in test tubes and in uh, uh, petri disease. Uh, disease eh? It reverse transcribe the RNA to DNA because the adenovirus is a DNA uh, virus. Now it linked that DNA, which is yet by reverse transcriptase, because uh, like we talk about HIV, it has its own machinery to do that. But coronavirus doesn't have. So in the lab, the scientist does it. So once he introduced it by microtubular action, this again gets into the uh, human nucleus. And in the human nucleus, there is lack of any integrase, okay? So therefore, it's just read off straight by the host cell nucleus to mRNA, which is then uh, extruded to the cytosol and proteins are formed, the spike proteins, because that's what we inserted as the gene for the spike protein uh, um, uh, antigen. And then now you get immune through that system. So remember this, the adenovirus has no cellular uh, has no enzymatic or enzyme machinery in order to integrate this um, SARS-CoV-2 uh, DNA into your, your DNA. So after it's read, it just dies because the virus cannot multiply. Uh, but by the time we've produced the spike protein, and therefore raise the immunogenicity of the cell. Uh, okay, maybe next, is there a next slide? So I'm talking at length there. Uh, I think, yeah, uh, uh, maybe I can, should I talk about this? It's a bit, uh, because this is one, uh, something which is uh, scary, uh, it scared a lot of people. So I, I'll talk, talk a bit about this. This is the CRISPR technology, okay? The CRISPR technology uh, is that uh, what was found in uh, uh, bacteria. Uh, so in the first image there, you see a fudge, which is a virus. And in the second image, you see it injecting injecting its uh, gene uh, material into the cell which it, it's attacking. And soon the cell machinery will be hijacked, produce more viruses and the, the bacterium dies. So uh, now what is found is these bacteria have some adaptation. And it begins with the work of one Japanese scientist who, who, when he sequences the uh, uh, prokaryotic gene, he sees that there are repeat sequences, you know, which is like, which is was seen as like, hey, this is not totally serving any purpose. But what is eventually found was, uh, he eventually discovered was these gene sequences integrated into the uh, bacterial uh, genome the prokaryote has no nucleus, by the way. So the genome is just in the cytos cytosol. So it's integrated into the, uh, those, its own gene for recognition purposes. So now once the virus comes to its, it or its progeny and injects its uh, genetic material, before it dies, it has a recognition system. So that's the CRISPR. And the recognition system on your right, uh, uh, right bottom is a protein with an RNA, okay? A protein with an RNA in yellow. So this RNA is complementary to those, or it recognizes those viral DNA which it had stored before. So if the virus comes to, to infect it and rupture itself, it uses this and then it recognizes that, okay, that's the virus I've met before. And now it uses this CRISPR system to chop up the, uh, the viral DNA before the viral DNA ruptures the, 
uh, entire bacterium. So it's like an immune system for the, for the bacteria against the virus. It's an immune system. And remember, this immune system works on RNA, complementary strains to the viral DNA that is being injected, which it had recognized before. So in short, that's it. Okay, next slide. Okay, so what if the, the CRISPR system, the Cas9 protein, what if now in the laboratory, I manufacture my own uh, RNA, complementary strain, and then I, I insert it into the Cas, Cas9. Okay, so I insert it into the Cas9 protein, and then this protein is a, a nuclease. That means its work is to chop up, to chop up the DNA or the RNA, whichever. So that's its task. So what if I insert my own recognition uh, RNA into this? So then it can it can chop up whatever sequence of uh, uh, DNA I'm targeting because I'm inserting my own recognition uh, RNA sequence, okay? So that's what, I, uh, what it essentially does. So, uh, so then if I said, okay, I want to chop up. Uh, Jennifer Doudna did it. She chopped up the, the gene for black colored uh, uh, mice and they have no color black, you know? The embryo, once fully grown, is just uh, white mice instead of black. Because she chopped up the gene for blackness, black color. So she did that, okay? Uh, so that's what has been done. Okay, so now uh, there is one video going around. It's on Bit uh, Chu, you know? And it's by some pastor, okay? Some pastor, so first of all, he's not a scientist. And second, second of all, those videos, even Jennifer Doudna's video, he only cut parts of it to show, you know? And you will listen to him through that video if you watched on BitChu. He tell his technician, stop there now, stop the video there. You know what? Because Jennifer Doudna actually talks a bit more than, than just this uh, crispier technology. She mentions, like in the slide, I, I think, let, let's, uh, let's just see that last slide. She mentions that one, this technology is not in that same uh, video. If you watch the entire link, not the chopped up bit by that pastor you will realize that he talks about uh, the, it's a bit difficult to deliver it into solid tissues. So she thinks that technology might be used in uh, hematology phase, you know, sickle cell anemia, we might uh, delete the gene in the causing sickle cell, okay? So uh, then two, uh, how some unknowns like, how do you deliver the CRISPR technology into millions of cells? Because we are made up of millions of cells. So how do I deliver this technology into the adult and therefore change him into a monkey? <laughs> you know, so, so it's quite, quite difficult. I've got to inject every single cell now, you know, and deliver the, uh, the Cas9 system into millions of cells. So it's, it's a bit difficult. Okay, then two, the, how do I control uh, the repair once the Cas9 has cut the DNA? How do I control it? Because there's two things called non-homology and homology repair. So these two compete, never mind homology means you provide the genetic sequence which will direct the repair. But never mind you do it, non-homology repair by the cell's own mechanism will also try its own repair, you know? So uh, how do you control for that, okay? And how do you control if 
the Cas9 will chop other other things, not just your target gene, because the Cas9 is not perfect anyway. It will read uh, the uh, it's too much uh, uh, molecular biology. It must read a, what is called a PEM sequence, and then it will read the complementary uh, sequence. So what if some of these sequences are similar, not exactly same? So now it's targeting things other than what you targeted. So that's what CRISPR technology is. She went on to talk about that in that same video, which the pastor cut, chop, chop this part off, stop it, stop the video, don't talk about it anymore. So he says like that. Eh? So she did mention about maybe CRISPR can be used for enhancement of the human. And so then you must get at the embryonic cell. Okay. Embryonic cell, the ones when you have one cell stage, four cell stage, that's where you, you work. Okay. So all of you who are who are going to receive the vaccines. You are not an embryo. You are an adult already. The, she will find difficult time to, to inject you with me, your millions of cells. You're not going to change into a monkey overnight. <laughs> well, it won't. It won't happen. And, uh, and two, um, now that you know that there's these difficulties, okay, then you also know that the adenoviral vector did not carry the necessary machinery. There is no CRISPR technology inside the adenoviral vector for AstraZeneca. And like I said, if you ask those scientists who, who claim that this AstraZeneca is the genetic uh, editing tool. So the, the question you should ask those scientists is, show me the CRISPR that has been inserted into the AstraZeneca vaccine. Show me the integrase that has been in, uh, in, included in the AstraZeneca vaccine. And show me the transcriptase system that has been included in the vaccine. So none of these scientists, I'm going to reiterate, none of these scientists who claim that the AstraZeneca is a gene editing tool, ever molecularly sequence the AstraZeneca vaccine and say, yes, I found CRISPR in the AstraZeneca. None of them, not a single one of them. In fact, if you can give me that one of them find it, uh, I won't give you a thousand dollars, but I'll give you a hundred dollars. <laughs> if you saw me the paper that the scientists sequenced the AstraZeneca vaccine, and he said, I found Cas9 in the AstraZeneca vaccine. I found it. I found it. The CRISPR technology is in that vaccine. If you can show me that, I'll be happy to, to pay you and I'll retract mine. But none of those scientists does that because, like I mentioned, the peer review of the molecular biology of AstraZeneca so that there is no Cas9 CRISPR system, there is no integrase, there is no reverse transcriptase. The vaccine is a safe vaccine. Sorry, I'm talking at length here, but, but I feel I must overthrow this CRISPR gene editing uh, conspiracy that has come about AstraZeneca vaccine. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Auto. Uh, when you say 100, is that $100 Fijian or 100 Kina? What is, what is that? No, no. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's Fijian, yeah. Oh, one other thing in that last slide, uh, let me don't show it, is people are scared that, uh, of, uh, what was it? The Americans call it warp speed production of the, of the vaccine, warp speed, man. You know, but that's not true. In that last slide, what is, uh, uh, what's happened is this work has been going on for decades. The uh, SARS virus, which is a coronavirus, was in 2002. Then 10 years later, uh, 2012, was the MERS virus, which is the coronavirus. 
And then finally, uh, the current one is COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. So this work of producing the vaccine, MERS vaccine was trialed in uh, Saudi Arabia. So uh, it's based on those work that we have the current vaccine. So it's not like just overnight AstraZeneca came with a vaccine like that or Pfizer or Moderna. No, this is a work which has come over those decades as the medical uh, fraternity and scientists try to deal with the SARS disease and the MERS disease by vaccination. So it's based on, on work which is already done. That's why we're able to have the SARS-CoV-2 uh, vaccine today, which is AstraZeneca, Pfizer, Moderna. It's foundation has been there to produce these vaccines for more than uh, 10 years, more than 10 years already. So don't fear and say that this is something come overnight. The gene editors have inserted it overnight. No, don't, don't uh, think like that, please. You know that this work has been uh, tested, tried over this uh, more than a decade in order for us to arrive at a safe vaccine. Uh, and my challenge still remains 100 Fijian dollar. If those scientists who claim that this is a gene editing tool, find the CRISPR in the AstraZeneca and find the integrase in the AstraZeneca or the reverse transcriptase in the AstraZeneca. If they find it, I'll give you a hundred. There we go, folks, you heard it here first. 100 Fijian dollars if you can find the CRISPR in the codes. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, like like you said, you know, it's very important to to see the whole picture. You know, it's very often you've got um, people cutting and pasting certain things to fit their narrative. But if you do the yeah, so if you need to be able to be thorough with with your readings and find the full the full story instead of getting bits and pieces that people will chop and change to fit their own agenda. Um, that's something that people need to be more critical of, um, especially in today's day and age. But, you know, people pay top dollar to get all the information that Dr. Uta has uh, provided, um, and you guys got it for free. So what a blessing, eh? Uh, we'll go on to the next question. Unless um, Dr. Wangana, you want to provide any anything on that? Or no? Nah? Okay. All good. All good, yeah. So we'll get the next question on the screen if we can, but I'll read it out here. So when you have the, the vaccination, are you contagious with COVID-19 for a period of time? If so, approximately how long? Uh, maybe I'll get uh, Dr. Wangana to speak. I think Dr. Uta is... Yeah. Throat is dry for now, so we get. Yeah, I'll, I'll have a drink of water. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, well, the answer is straightforward no. Just no? Uh, no, no, the answer no, is no. I think. No, Doc, I think the question is I'm just thinking, maybe the question is after you get the vaccine, can you still be infected for, for some time? Maybe that's the question. Not so much that you are contagious and spreading it. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. I mean, that, that's why you are having those uh, bit of side effects, you know, a bit of fever. But those are the normal reactions to the to the to the vaccine. It's, you have the minor short term reaction. Uh, but that's that's common with all the other with the, all all the other vaccines. Uh, but you are you are not contagious. You won't be going around infecting. Uh, other people, unless of course you you catch the infection itself, but then your uh, infectious status will be much lower. If you are vaccinated and you catch the the COVID nineteen infection, your infectious uh, ability is much much less. Mm. Mm. So going off that, you are, you are not contagious. Yeah. You you won't go around infecting people by getting the vaccine. Mm. So going off that. Um, would you be considered uh, fully vaccinated as soon as you get the jab or does it take a bit of time for the 
the vaccination to work in the body? Well, if, if you get the first, first vaccine, I mean the first dose rather, your protection level won't be that high, all right? Until you get your second jab, which is AstraZeneca, as we know, it's two to three months. And uh, usually two weeks after your uh, second jab, you will be fully you know, protected according to the ability of the, of the vaccine, which is 90, 95%. Uh, it takes time for the immune system to recognize and build up to that uh, yeah. protective level. So once you've got the second dose, don't think I'm Superman. Uh, I can go and do anything now. No, just keep some protection still at that mm -hmm. time while the immune system is building up. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think we've answered that question or all interpretations of that question. Um, just a reminder, everyone uh, um, tuning in, if you've got any burning questions you'd like to ask, feel free to raise your hands um, and we'll, we'll get to you. Or even just comment in the, in the, um, the comment section. I uh, will try and get our experts to answer them as quick as they can or as thoroughly as they can. So we'll go on to the next one. The next question, which will be on the slide now. Do people who've recovered from COVID-19 need to get vaccinated? Uh, okay, I have uh, maybe a statement uh, which is yes. So earlier in the talk, we talk about waning, uh, waning immunity. So you build up the immune immunity to a certain level, then after some time it wanes. So similar to the infection too. Once you catch the infection, your immune uh, system goes up. Um, you've caught that one infection. Uh, immune system does two things. First, it does recognition, yeah? And then when the second injection uh, comes, it consolidates. So, uh, so that it's good, Never mind. I have the disease, but after some time, if I receive the the injection, the immune system is uh, is more recognition and achieves a uh, higher level. Or if my immune system wins, it's good I receive that vaccine and it boosts up my immunity again. So yes. All right, uh, Dr. Mangana, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think I think that's it. I've I um, uh, totally agree with what Dr. James said. Okay. So, yeah, although you might have recovered from, uh, from COVID, it's just it's still very important that you get that vaccine so your, your body is fully equipped to fight the virus. Um, we had another question, but uh, they appear to have dropped out due to technical difficulties from the audience. So we'll go on to this question here. Uh, if we get it on the slide for everyone to read, um, and then I'll read it out here as well. So uh, since COVID-19 is caused by a virus and viruses um, are considered are constantly changing and mutating, how effective is the current vaccination process uh, long-term? Uh, will my current vaccination be enough to protect against future variants? Uh, I'll open it up to either or, just jump in. Okay, I'll, I'll start with this. Sorry, if you can put the question back again. So I think the, the, the main uh, component of this question is how long you are protected, is it? Let me just see it again. Yeah, like... um long-term effects. They will, I think they're trying to gauge how this vaccination will go with the long-term. Yeah. Yeah. So, so with the current uh, vaccination uh, protocol, as we said, uh, the, the two doses. All right. Um, don't forget that COVID-19 is a, is a new disease. And 
you know, we are, we are still learning as, as, as things progress. And we can only learn more with the data that keeps coming out in, at the different stages or subsequent years that we are suffering from, from the disease. So that is why I said earlier on that with the two doses, the current protocol is two doses, but you know, when new data comes, comes out earlier on, then there might be a need for, for a third dose to, to give you that long-term effect of uh, protection. And it's similar to the, to the variant, like uh, for the Delta variant, they, they, the, the data that came out recently have shown that, um, as we said earlier on, that AstraZeneca, well, it was 67 before, but it, it has gone right up uh, with new, new details coming up. So it will be the same process or same thing as for future variants. We will only know as, as, as things progresses and the, the data, the new data comes and, oh yes, it's effective against this uh, new variant uh, that comes in. And you know, the hallmark of uh, trying to vaccinate everyone well, at, at least to reach the herd immunity level, is to try and prevent these uh, different variants coming out. The less number of population uh, that are vaccinated, the more you, you will allow these variants to, to come up. And, you know, we, we will keep struggling as, as, we, as we go along because you're allowing time for this uh, um, uh, COVID to, to, to have the, the different variants coming up. So I think the message is you know, to get vaccinated um, as much as we can at, at a faster rate so that we reach that head immunity quickly so we don't allow new, new variants to, to come up because then we will have to say, oh, okay, let's see if this uh, vaccine is effective against this variant because we will only know um, as the data comes up in, in those different uh, stages with the subsequent years ahead of us. Yeah, thank you. And uh, how did the Delta variant come up? That's the one question it's interesting to think about. The Delta variant came about because of the circulation of the original virus within non-immune population. And then as it keeps circulating, it changes characteristics. So if we had had a vaccine to the original strain and everybody willing to take it, we would have arrested those changes which gave rise to the Delta variant. So this is one reason why uh, uh, we all should work together. Like if we can vaccinate now so that these strains don't keep on circulating and changing characteristic and we'll be always playing catch up, which is what we are doing with flu uh, virus really. We're trying to catch up to it as it, it just changes its uh, antigenic uh, uh, characteristics. So this coronavirus, the more of us we take it and we like get it close down the disease, the less of it circulates, transmits around and giving the chance for changes in the strain. So if you don't want to see Jita strain, that's the Greek, last Greek letter, I think. If you don't want to see Zeta strain, please go and take your vaccine now. You know, be part of the, the uh, all of us helping together. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, we've all got to try and um, you know, stop the spread and prevent any sort of mutation um, and, you know, be more of a risk to, to our friends and family in the community. Um, yeah, so we'll go on to the next question now. Uh, it's from Fiona, who has asked, uh, why is uh, mass vaccination imposed, especially here in Australia, particularly in New South Wales? Is it because of the contagious nature of Delta variant? I think we just, we just answered that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think we just answered that. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree as well. Um, so let's see what the next question is. All right, we'll go on to the next one from Kimberly. You can get that on the screen. Yeah, so um, are there any studies about how people are okay after getting vaccinated?
So, okay. um, uh, uh, yeah. it's a uh, the question a uh, bit general, but I think yeah. maybe the intent of the question was uh, after getting vaccination, does someone drop dead? <laughs> maybe, maybe they get the vaccine and drop dead. No? So uh, I should say no, because I got two vaccines, but I did not drop dead. So maybe that's just a quick short answer to that. Uh, but um, some people have, have died. Eh? But you must think about cause and effect. This is an important thing. Like if, if, I, if I drink chloroquine, then I died uh, after I drank, uh, or maybe atimeter, <laughs> but that's the malaria medicine. Eh? So I drank atimeter, then I died. So now, did I die from the atimeter or did the malaria kill me? You, know, the, the, you must ask that question, you know? Hey, did I die from... So uh, that's something which like needs certification. Eh? Like, do I die from the, the medicine or did I die from the disease? So it's very important question that way. You, I cannot just say, oh, he drank the tablet, so he died. Maybe the disease killed me. So he got the injection, then he died. So that question of, did the injection kill him or the vaccine kill him or he died of his own disease? You know, something like that. Maybe some underlying disease is there, which the patient might have died from. So in short, what it means is, uh, uh, the deaths need verification, certification, and then the cause is determined. If necessary, we have to do post-mortem studies to find out the cause of death, what's causing the death. So, so far, uh, there is no death which is stated as the direct consequence of having the injection, this patient dropped dead. I haven't seen that, that uh, data yet, no. Right. And Dr. Wangara, would you like to give your two cents on, on yeah. the question? I, I don't know what the question is really asking, but it's in line with what James said. Uh, Probably maybe what they want is articles to show, you know, say, let's say, these are uh, all the people who, who got, say, AstraZeneca. Okay. How many of them actually died? So let's say maybe a thousand of them got it. How many of them died? So with the, with the, the articles that came up, they... I was going to put for us AstraZeneca. What they said was the because it's the, I think it's the blood clot that people are worried worried about with AstraZeneca. What they found in these uh, studies is that the risk of developing blood clot from AstraZeneca is about one in two hundred fifty thousand. Okay. Now the risk of actually dying. Dying from that is one in a million. All right, so the risk of having the clot, one in 250,000, okay? Like it doesn't mean that you die from the clot straight away, but some people can actually die. And the risk of that is about one in a, one in a million. Whereas the risk of dying from uh, COVID-19 currently is roughly about two, Two in a hundred, two percent. So you make a choice. Which one do you want? Getting infected and your chance of dying is two in a hundred, or get the job and your chance of dying is one in a million. Yeah, yeah very powerful when you put it like that and you compare the likelihood of each happening. Um, and I think it's also important to note that um, 
before you get the vaccine to you know consult your your local gp or your um some of the medical professionals as they know um of your underlying conditions that might be affected by the vaccine although it might be rare it's just important just to know which vaccine might be best for you um and so in saying that, I think we've got our last question of the night, which is uh, from Anonymous. We'll grab that on the screen. Uh, the question is, what are the known short-term and long-term side effects for the health of women who are currently breastfeeding um, and their babies? Yeah, okay, maybe I start Dr. Bangan and then you can carry uh, add something. Uh, I've just read a paper uh, which is published in uh, The Lancet, which is a peer reviewed uh, publication. So Lancet, New England journals, maybe uh, they are at the top of the heap of journals that the medical people read. And this publication, uh, recruited women into a study called the V study. This is pregnant women. And um, about 4% of those women decided that they agreed that, yes, I'll be part of the study. No, the rest of the women, never mind, they got the jab, pregnant women. They said, no, I don't really want to be part of that study. So it followed them up. Uh, through this period from when the vaccine was started. And now it's still going on, the study, but the, the publication's interim uh, uh, release of the data. Uh, so uh, the conclusion of the paper is that there is no safety risk signals from these women, pregnant women who got the vaccine. So that's the interim conclusions of the ongoing uh, uh, a registry and uh, of of pregnant women women who who had the vaccine so uh, that's a promising thing that the uh, safety profi profile in in women uh, pregnant women and those babies already born is it's fine oh, uh, one other thing this study uh, those women who participate they were in the third trimester of pregnancy. Uh, so uh, many, their, uh, their ch children already born. Third trimester is the last trimester. Uh, and few of those women who were pregnant were in as early as 12 weeks. And when they participated and followed up over time for uh, safety issues, even those women, few women with earlier pregnancies, there was no harm to their pregnancy and no harm to their babies by the time those babies were born. Uh, so that's the reassuring data published in, in the Lancet, Lancet or New England, uh, New England Journal, sorry. It's an it's a American study that, uh, that study in pregnancy. So it's a reassuring uh, uh, finding uh, from those women who participated that indeed they were safe and their pregnancies were safe. Their babies, growing babies were fine. Cool. With that article as well, was that, um, was that study done on multiple vaccines or just a particular vaccine or... Uh, yeah, the, the, this study was done in the States, so the two vaccines used in the States are Pfizer and, and Moderna, but although they've got some stock of Astra, Seneca too there, um, so these two vaccines. And then um, maybe I just relate our experience here in uh, Fiji, based on those studies, we're receiving Moderna for the pregnant women. That's what we are we are practicing here in uh, in Fiji. The the Astra we don't give to to the pregnant women here. So Moderna is being reserved for the pregnant women here in 
Yeah, so, so just just to add on to what Dr. James said in support of that, uh, also in the what do you call the Wall Street Journal, that's in the states as well. They what they found was uh, there were lots of deaths in pregnancy in women that were pregnant in the state, deaths from uh, COVID-19. And, and what they found out was most of them died because of the, because when they were pregnant, uh, there was hesitancy in, in getting the vaccines. These were women who didn't actually get vaccinated during their, their pregnancy. So uh, when they did this trial, they, they they vaccinate these pregnant women, especially in the third trimester, as Dr. James said. And, and they found that <clears throat> the antibodies that mothers develop against COVID-19 were also present in the, in the baby. So, so it's protective for both the mother and, and the baby. So, so that article just came out recently and uh, they were talking about it uh, at CNN as well, and I had a look through it as well. So now they said that, because before the, the, the recommendation is, they said, oh, because we don't have the evidence in pregnant women, if it's not urgent, maybe don't take it. But if there's a, you know, epidemic around, you know, and, you know there's a need for that, get vaccinated. So because of that, a lot of women were hesitant. Oh, so it's, you know, because there's no data to support it, maybe we we'll wait first until after we deliver. But then before they deliver, they catch COVID and most of them actually died. And they actually showed some fathers, it was actually a very sad situation where some fathers, they took home uh, just their babies only without the mother because the mother actually died from uh, COVID. So the recommendation now is for the mother, uh, pregnant mother to, to be vaccinated, especially in the, in the third uh, trimester. Thank you, uh, doctors. It's good um, that you're both being updated and uh, we've got you know, the, the latest articles to keep us informed about what's going on and how we can better protect ourselves um, in these difficult times. And um, I just want to thank the both of you for, you know, taking the time out to, to educate us and, um, you know, even provide lecture slides on, on how we can, how to better understand the whole process of how this virus works, and especially how the, the vaccine works and um, what are the, be what the best steps are to, to, you know, to keep our community safe, um, especially with the fight against the, the COVID-19. So thank you both for your time and your energy. Um, especially want to thank all the people that have tuned in. Um, you know, I hope you've taken a lot away from it. If you have any questions, you know, don't hesitate to ask. Um, you can you feel free to reach out to us on Facebook or Instagram or in our emails. Um, we will happily, you know, get back to you uh, with, with uh, whichever burning questions you were. You might have been maybe a bit too shy to ask in, during the Q&A. Um, but thank you to those who have asked. Um, I'm sure a lot of people were thinking about these questions, but um, didn't want to ask them personally. So thank you all. Um, thank you for, um, you know, just coming together and uh, wanting to, to know more and um, to gain a better understanding of how everything is working at the moment. Um, it's good that we're, you know, taking on, taking on this role and trying to do better by our people and our community. Um, yeah, so in saying that, I'd just like to say, you know, we, we've, we're coming down to nine o'clock here in, uh, in Sydney. So it'll probably be about 11 p.m. in, in Fiji. Um, so it's uh, bedtime for a lot of us. So thank you all once again for coming. And, uh, it's, you know, we're going to have to end it there. So thank you all. And um, yeah, I'm going to say bye from me. Um, any final words from Dr. Wangana and Dr. Uto? Yeah, I'll just say what I said the other time, like uh, to to those my people in Solomon's, go take Nilana. 
<laughs> Nila finish two, two times. <laughs> so, uh, you know, get your vaccine, keep safe. Uh, that's my recommendation. Don't be scared of CRISPR technology in the AstraZeneca. Don't be scared of integrase in the AstraZeneca. None of those scientists who claim that AstraZeneca in, uh, has those gene editing tools, none of them, none, ever sequenced the AstraZeneca vaccine in his laboratory. And then he says that, yes, the AstraZeneca has CRISPR, the AstraZeneca has integrase or reverse transcriptase. None of them, because, because they are merely like scaring you. None of them. All sequences done on the vaccine shows that it's just the genome for the spike protein of the uh, coronavirus, which will make you immune. So have uh, courage, informed, go and get your vaccine. Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, last words from me. So <clears throat> uh, just going back to the different, uh, you know, websites and who, who you are, where you, uh, you are getting your information from. I'd like to encourage you to go to the uh, CDC website, right? Uh, WHO website. Now, for the for the articles, um, the only issue with the, you know, getting articles from DMJ and uh, Lancet and New England Medical Journal. If you, if, if you might be able to read um, abstracts, but if you want to read the whole, you know, whole study, you, you will have to subscribe to it. So, you know, some money are involved. If you want to prove, you know, what we've been talking about, but these are the reliable sites where you get uh, reliable information from. Also in, in CNN, if you, if you go to uh, uh, CNN, uh, um, www.cnn and then forward slash fact versus fiction. All right, they will they will tell you you know what is fiction or German or or a lie and what is what is the truth. And for BBC too, you, you can go online. They have a have their website where they give you facts as well versus uh, versus fiction. So the, these are the trustworthy website. Don't don't uh, buy you know into these uh, certain websites where they can mislead you. Uh, always cross check them where they are coming from, and and who are the actual authors of those other websites that that uh, that you come to. And and the other thing is uh, final word is um, the vaccine itself. You see, it's not only about the disease we are talking about. We, people are complaining about. Oh, borders not open and business is no running long. There's no money and so the thing is, if we get vaccinated, it's very obvious with those countries that have rich herd immunity that they are opening up their 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 borders. Like Denmark, there's no more COVID re restriction for Denmark. It was it just came out on the news a couple of days ago because they've already reached their herd immunity, so they opened their borders business as usual, people try to go back to their, to their normal life. And that is the only answer. If it's not vaccine, what else is the answer? I cannot think of anything else. So I'm just um, uh, encouraging all of us, my one talks, uh, wherever you are, whether it be in uh, Solomon's or uh, Fiji or uh, here in one or two or PNG, I think that that's the the answer to all these um, problems that we are having. Just get vaccinated, reach herd immunity, and let's try to go back to to some normality in in wherever we are we are living in. Thank you, doctors. Yes, it's very important that we reach herd immunity. Um, you got um, you know cases like um, New Caledonia, which have recently had a big surge. With the um, with the COVID outbreak that's happening right now, um, so everyone's in lockdown, and um, I think a lot of our communities you know, all over the Pacific are really doing their best and struggling 
uh, with this virus. But I think if we work together and um, we, we do our best to find the right information um, from the people that have done the work to provide this information, then we can get through this um, together as a people. So um, I think in saying that, thank you once again, and uh, I'm gonna wish you a very good night. Thank you all. Yeah, good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone.